Okay, so um, generally speaking, uh, to express any vector in a new coordinate system, you multiply it and actually uh, matrix multiplication um, is not commutative, uh, so you have to left multiply it. The matrix has to go on the left by a rotation matrix. Um, and so first, I guess, we have to make sure that everybody knows how to multiply by a matrix. Um, to multiply a vector by a matrix, say that you have the matrix A, B, C, D and you're multiplying it by the vector EF. You do that um, by taking the dot product of the top row of the matrix with the vector. That gives you your, um, your first component of your output. And then you take the dot product of the second row of the matrix times the vector. So. Um, your first component is going to be A times E plus B times F. And your second component is going to be C times E plus D times F. You just keep going. Um, so if you have, um, so if you add A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I times J, K, L, you'd go. Um, A times J plus B times K plus C times L for the first component. Then D times J plus E times K plus F times L. And then uh, G times J plus H times k plus i times l. Yeah, so the, um, the number of elements in the rows of the matrix has to be as the same as the number of components of the vector. But you could have like asymmetrical ones. We're just not doing that. And for this class, we're only going to be dealing with two-dimensional ones, so um, the vectors, the matrices are going to be two by two, and the vectors are going to be two, two component vectors. Um, okay, so now to come up with the rotation matrix, um, so here's like you can think of this as a definition of the rotation matrix, and this definition, by the way, holds in three dimensions. Um, I suppose there's probably rotation matrices in bigger dimensions. It isn't very relevant to mechanics, but um, three dimensions, like if you take uh, D-form with me, we'll, we'll use rotation matrices in three dimensions a lot. Um, what? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you got to wait till spring of 2015, but it's worth it.
Oh yeah, 16, right. Yeah. But if you run into me on the street, I'll explain it to you. Just ask me about it. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, okay, so the rotation matrix. Suppose that you have a vector V expressed in coordinate system A. So to express it in coordinate system B, the columns of the rotation matrix are the coordinate system axes of A expressed in coordinate system B. OK, so that's sort of confusing to think about. Um, why don't I just give you the formula instead? But I, I do want to show you that the formula makes sense with this definition. And this is sort of a general definition that will always work with rotation matrices. Um, so the rotation matrix Q is equal to um, the cosine of theta, sine of theta, negative sine of theta, cosine of theta. Where theta is the counterclockwise angle going from the original coordinate system to the final coordinate system. OK, so for example, let's say that our original coordinate system is this. So that's our original. And we want to go to a final coordinate system like this, where the angle from the horizontal to the x-axis is 45 degrees. OK, so what's the counterclockwise angle theta that takes the original coordinate system and aligns it with the final coordinate system. Positive 45. Um, if we were trying to go, if this was the original and this was the final, then it would just be negative 45. Um, and so the, coord, uh, the rotation matrix is cosine of 45, sine of 45, negative sine of 45, and cosine of 45. Yep. For a matrix in general. It's sort of like the vector symbol. Um, OK, so let's go back and um, compare the answer we got here to that definition I just gave. Um, so if this is coordinate system A and this is coordinate system B, the columns of this matrix should be these coordinate axes expressed in this coordinate system. OK, so The red is the x-axis of the original coordinate system, and the green is the y-axis of the original coordinate system. In this final coordinate system, what would be the components of 
the red axis. Point seven oh seven one negative point seven oh seven one. And so the column here represents the original coordinate system expressed in the new coordinate system. And then the second one should be the should be the green vector expressed in the new coordinate system. So what are the components of this green unit vector in the in the final coordinate system? Well, positive x, so 0 0.7071, positive y, positive 0 0.7071, so you get this. So that's, you know, as you're doing these problems, you're not going to be thinking about this definition, but um, that's probably something that'll, at some point in your uh, time in mechanics, help you understand rotation matrices a little bit. Um, yes. Yes, to do it on a calculator. Well, I would recommend um, on D2L, it tells you how to program the rotation matrix function. Um, and so, I mean, if you were going to, if you were just going to type this in on a TI calculator, you would do it as um, 0 0.7071, comma, 0 0.7071, semicolon, and then negative 0.7071, comma, positive 0.7071. So you do it, uh, the top row, semicolon, bottom row, and then you can just use the multiplication symbol to multiply this to vectors. Okay, so let me go through a full example where I start out with, I mean, this isn't going to be a structure, but I'm going to start out with a beam that's at an angle. It's really a rigid body problem. Um, calculate the external loads and then use the rotation matrix to re-express it in a new coordinate system. And then from there, calculate the internal loads. Okay, so it's a lot of steps, but none of the steps are really particularly that difficult. You just have to sort of keep track of where you are in the process. All right, so let's say that there's a beam connected to the floor by a pin joint leaning up against the wall with a frictionless contact. And let's say that this angle is 30 degrees. The mass of the beam is 2,000 kilograms. Wow, these are big beams. <laughs> and. Uh, I guess I, I have to make them big beams because if uh, the effect of gravity isn't big enough, you're you know going to be mad that you have to do this. Okay, so calculate T, V, and M. So the first step is we need to calculate the external loads. So you have a force down here, call that FA. You have a weight of 19,620. Why can I treat the weight as a point force here? Yep, why, so why for this part, don't I have to treat that weight as a distributed load? Why can I treat it as a point force? What? Well, actually, it's just because now that I've drawn the free body, I've already gotten to the point where no matter what you're doing, you can represent that distributed load as a point force. And uh, what kind of force is applied by the wall? That's a frictionless contact. So it's a known direction this way. Call that N. 
Um, and so, Newton's second law, if you wanted, you could write out the table for this. Um, but Newton's second law gives f a x f a y plus 0, negative 19,620 plus negative f b 0 is equal to zeros. Yes. Negative n, thanks. And then the rotational equation, um, I'll make my about point A. So there's no moment produced by FA. Um, there is, okay, well, I just have the numbers here. Um, the total moment produced by this 19,620 force, it's a clockwise moment of 40,000. 779.4, and then um, N would produce a counterclockwise moment of 2.4 N. No, but I have it written here. <laughs> okay, so 4.8 meters. That's equal to zero. So solve all that and you get that F A is the vector 16,991.4, and N is equal to 16,991.4. Those are the external loads in, um, in a coordinate system oriented like this, with x horizontal and y vertical. Uh, we want to re-express in a coordinate system. So we want to go from this coordinate system to, well, where's the new, how's the new coordinate system going to be oriented? Yeah, it's going to be tilted up like this. And notice you always have with these problems two options. Um, I mean, if we wanted, we could make the x-axis pointed down this side. And you'd have to do a little fiddling with your answers at the end, but the answers would match each other. It's just that your functions would be defined in terms of an x that's backwards. OK, so um, what's theta for this rotation? Positive 30. And so now to make the transformation, um, that force FA, we're going to take, um, OK, so Q, I guess, is going to be equal to uh, cosine of 30 which is 0.866, sine of 30, 0.5, negative sine of 30, and positive cosine of 30. So there's the rotation matrix. FA um, is going to be 0 0.866, 0 0.5, negative 0.5, positive 0.866 times the vector that we just solved for, 16,991.4, Uh No. Um, the way people do it, I mean, th there really isn't, like, every way to do it is kind of cumbersome. So um, if you ever need to be clear about that, people usually just write, um, sometimes they'll write FA relative to 
coordinate system A or something like that. But um, yeah, I guess um, so. Vectors are a funny thing. Like F A, we write that that F A is equal to these components, but F A really is just a direction and a magnitude, you know, and so. This really is not FA exactly. This is a numerical way of expressing FA in a certain coordinate system. And so in a sense, these are both FA just expressed in different coordinate systems. Yeah, right. So wouldn't that be FA over B? So, so yeah, this would be FA expressed in A, and the answer we're going to get is F-A, yeah. Uh, and if you do that multiplication, you get 24,525 for the X component, and then 8,495.7 for the y component, and that's in newtons. And then, um, the way I have it written in my notes is this is just the new FA. Yep, well, N we're not gonna have to because that's on the right side, and so when we do our internal loads, that's not gonna come into it. Um, but the distributed load we do have to deal with. So the next thing we have to do is the new distributed load representing the weight. Um, okay, so what was our old? So here's what we had before. We had FA equal to 16,991.4, and then the Y component is 19,620. And then we had a distributed load acting down. Um, what's the value of the distributed load, or how do we get that? Yeah, so we have a total weight of 19,620. We're going to divide that by 4.8. And so you get a value of uh, 4,087.5 newtons per meter acting down. And then we also have this force here, but um, that's not going to come into it, but 16,991.4. Okay, so the distributed load, if we think of that as like a distributed load vector, it has components 0, negative 4087.5. And that's what we're going to multiply by the matrix. So we have 0 0.866.5, negative 0 0.5, 0 0.866, multiplied by 0, Four oh negative four oh eight seven point five. And if you multiply that, you get the new distributed load vector negative two thousand forty three point eight newtons per meter, and the y component negative three five three nine point nine newtons per meter. And then you could calculate the new n, but that's not going to come into it. So skip n, that won't come up. But you would do it the same way. Um, do we want to? No, we don't want to skip n. That's crazy. 
Okay, so um, the new normal force, the new normal. Um, isn't that a show? Uh, so 0 0.866, 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, 0 0.866 times the force vector. Remember that normal force is pointing to the left, so this is negative 16,991.40. And we get a new vector, negative 14,715 newtons, positive 8,495.7 newtons. Okay, so now we can finally think of this beam in the orientation that we like for, um, for internal loads calculations. We have a force vector on this end of 24,525, 8,000, 495.7. We have something go going on over here that you know we don't care about. And then the distributed loads. Um, so we have a horizontal distributed load in the negative x direction. So 20,043.8 newtons per meter, and then we have another distributed load downward of 35, 39.9 newtons per meter. How many important points do we have? Just the two endpoints. These functions are constant the whole way. So one here, one here, and so we just have to make one cut. And this is valid for all x values between 0 and 4.8. We have the force vector of 24, 525, um, and then 8495.7. And now that we've chosen the body to isolate, we can treat those distributed loads as point forces. So we have one pointing to the left with a magnitude of 2,043.8x, and we have one pointing down with a magnitude of 3539.9x, and then the internal loads, T, V, and M. So Newton's second law says 24,525, 8,495.7 plus negative 2043.8x, negative 3539.9x plus T negative V is equal to zeros. So T is equal to 2043.8x minus 24,525. And V is equal to negative 3539.9x plus 
8,495.7. And then the rotational equation. Uh, the force at the left end doesn't produce a moment about the left end. The horizontal distributed load doesn't. The vertical distributed load does produce a moment. It's clockwise, so it's going to be negative. Um, so negative 3539.9x times its moment arm of x over 2 plus m minus vx is equal to 0. So m is equal to, um, if you plug all that stuff in, you get, well, m is equal to 1769.95x squared minus 3539.9x squared. I'm just doing all the plugging in for v plus 8495.7x. And so your final value is negative 17,069.95x squared. No? It, but then this one's half of this one, and so you end up with that little thing, that little trick comes up a lot. Um, and then 8495.7x. Okay, so is dmdx equal to v? If you take the derivative of this, it's equal to v, so yeah. Um, and so what we get out of this is, um, I don't have these plotted, but um, you get a tension that varies as you go along the length, a shear force that varies as you go along the length, and a bending moment that varies as you go along the length. Any questions about that? And then, uh, so I did one of the four checks. Um, I suppose we probably should do the other ones. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a lot of work. <laughs> so I think we're going to skip that one today. But you, I mean, those same four checks still apply, you know. You still have those same ways to sort of sanity check your answer, make sure that it makes sense. Are the questions on the test going to be questions that you'll be able to graph about? Well, I'm not going to make you graph them on the test. I'll just make you come up with the functions. And, and to do those checks, you can, all you're doing is plugging in end values for x in these equations, so you don't need to graph them. But... What do we know? Well, we know that that thing has a pin joint at one end and a frictionless contact at the other end. So there's no point couples at either end, right? So we know that whatever this quadratic function looks like, it needs to be zero when x is equal to zero. Well, that, that we can see is obviously true. And it also has to be zero when you plug in 4.8 for x. So it should be, you know, uh, concave. So it should be something like that. Any other questions? So you still you still do those the same way. Um, you just look for places. So the endpoints, and then any point forces, and then any places where a distributed load function changes. Okay. But um, our distributed loads, since they were just weight, they were the same function over the whole thing. And so we didn't have any changes in the distributed load. Is that a triangle? Yeah. Is that, that also, since it's the same function, 
um, you don't have any important points for that. It's only if it's only in cases where like you know you have a couple of practice problems where you have like a distributed load that starts halfway across, then this would be an important point. Okay, that's it.